Hi, I'm Rod Rourke. Welcome to episode 13, Rourke Knows. You know, we get asked all the time, what does it take to become a plastic surgeon? And, you know, you've heard a little bit about who and what I am, but, you know, what does it take to become a plastic surgeon from pre-med to medical school? So I thought it'd be great to bring in my fellows this year. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the making of a plastic surgeon. So, Jeffrey... Uh, Lasecki is actually from University of Michigan, and of course, he's from uh, my alma mater. And of course, uh, we got Michael Kyoto, who's also from NYU. So we got two incredible powerhouse universities, and we want to talk a little bit about what it takes. So, uh, so let's talk, uh, Jeff. So tell me a little bit about you know where you grew up and what was your undergraduate degree and why did you go into plastic surgery and that road? And then I'm going to ask the same of Michael. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, so I, I'm from the Detroit area. I grew up in Michigan uh, and then went to Brown University for undergrad where I did a uh, math and biology combined major there um, the whole time doing research. I actually wasn't thinking of medical school for um, for some time um, until I realized that, you know, that kind of, you know, that was kind of where my passions were. So uh, I went to University of Michigan Medical School. Um, and in my first year, there is where I really discovered plastic surgery and learned that I wanted to become a plastic surgeon. Who did you um, rotate with? I rotated. I started doing research with uh, Dr. Ben Levy, who's um, yeah. who's, who's at UT now, um, uh, when he was in his residency and, you know, got got involved yep. uh, studying burn reconstruction, studying, you know, fat derived stem cells um, and uh, and then just started spending time around the whole plastic surgery department as part of that. And then realized that was that was really it. Um, so so four years of medical school. Um, and that whole time doing research, you know, uh, spending extra time uh, going to plastic surgery ORs, going to the journal clubs, going to the conferences, um, really so doing all of that. That's four plus four. Four plus four. So, so we're looking at eight. Yes. Okay. And then <laughs> yeah, what? Eight years. Um, and then after <laughs> that, plastic surgery residency. So I stayed at University of Michigan uh, for for my residency training. That's six clinical years. A lot of people at University of Michigan do one or two years of research as well. Um, that's sort of an, an individual thing, uh, right. but six, six clinical years. So that gets us up to 14, uh, <laughs> clinical years, uh, or 14 years of education. Right. And just so you know, plastic surgery today, probably the longest training in all of the specialties in surgery, including cardiac. So we really, when we're done, we're probably the most highly trained surgeons in the hospital position. So, uh, it's great. So Michael, I'll say about your path. So, you know, plastic surgery is not just kind of the short road. There's a lot of delayed gratification. Absolutely. So it's a long Michael road. Michael is a Midwestern boy like I am. So hundred percent. Yeah. So I'm from uh, Southern Illinois, three or four hours South of Chicago. Um, went to a small undergrad liberal arts school in central Illinois as well called Illinois Wesleyan University. It's a school of just about 2000, 2000 students. I went into college thinking I was going to be a football coach like my dad. Uh, my dad is a high school football coach, kind of where we grew up. Um, uh, and early on, I had an injury playing football and decided to quit and start volunteering in the hospital and kind of got into medicine that way. So it was a little more of a roundabout way. Just started interacting with sick people and patients and caught a passion for it. And decided to pr pr uh, pursue medicine through there. Uh, that was at the end of my freshman year of college. So I changed my... Uh, undergrad to chemistry and finished my degree in chemistry. At, yeah. So at, chemistry, at math, and biology. Right? So, so basically there's a lot of pathways. I actually was a zoology major. I mean, you know, yeah. you know, all, all that stuff is very important when you become a doctor, not, yeah. you know, but, but it's, you know, it gets you in that mindset yeah. right, of science and thinking mm -hmm. analytically. And mm -hmm. stuff, so. Absolutely. And then, and then went to medical school at university of Loyola, Chicago in, in Maywood, Illinois, Thought I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon because of my sports background. Started um, spending time with the orthopedic group at Loyola and realized that it was not a good fit for me. Started shadowing in plastic surgery and immediately fell in love with it. So that was my uh, first year of medical school. And uh, spent a lot of time shadowing the couple plastic surgeons at the hospital there, getting involved in research, um, attending their meetings, and spending time with them in the operating room. And then uh, was fortunate enough to match uh, in plastic surgery at NYU. And spent okay. six six years in so Manhattan. four plus four plus six plus six yeah so fourteen fourteen years. again fourteen years yeah. it almost sounds like a, a jail term but it's not <laughs> no it's phenomenal but these these this is medicine this is delayed gratification 
And that's the difference between going to other professions. It's a long run, you know, but you got to have a focus and a passion and you got to know, you know, what you want to drive to. That's why it's so important. Don't you think that you really got to love what you're going to do? Because if you don't love medicine, number one, and if you don't love plastic surgery, man, it's, it's a long road. hundred percent. Yeah. In the beginning, you have to just be passionate about helping people, helping right. people in a time of need. That's what, that's what will get you through many of the long years. And then after that, you can hone your skills in and decide on what you really want to do, which for us, it was plastic surgery, but medicine's a huge field. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And helping, and of course the helping people doesn't change. It's just that how we help people yeah. is different. But I mean, I think that you're right. I mean, you got to be passionate. You be, be got to be compassionate. You got to be compassionate and, uh, and you gotta, you gotta want to do it long-term. I mean, I think the biggest thing is, you have to hang in there. I mean, I tell my kids all the time, you know, uh, you know, you got to do things just to get to the next phase of where you want to be. And that means you got to be driven and look long term, not short term, because sometimes when you're doing advanced calculus and, uh, and doing biochemistry, it doesn't quite. <laughs> yeah, say, it's hard to see. How mm -hmm. am I going to how's that going to make me a better plastic surgeon? Right. Yeah. yeah. So, no, I know. And so so that's the. Uh, that's the road. And, and of course, these guys all went to phenomenal programs. And, and, uh, but, you know, it doesn't matter where you're coming from. It's where you're going. Don't yeah. you think? I mean, uh, these guys have very similar paths. They ended up at phenomenal training programs. And, and, and in the U.S. today, plastic surgery is the most competitive residency. In fact, I think today um, only about two-thirds of people that want to go into plastic surgery get to go into plastic surgery, which is unfortunate. Yeah. But it is so competitive. And, um, but so passion, be driven, be focused and keep your eye on, on your goal. I think it's very, very important to do. And, uh, so what advice before we talk about subspecialty training? So what advice do you guys have, uh, for people that want to go into plastic surgery? They're now in, into, you know, they're in medical school. And so what advice do you have? So Jeff, I'm going to ask you that first and then Michael. Mm -hmm. Um, so be, be really intentional about how you go about doing it. Um, so, you know, if you, if you think this is something that you want to do, that you want to make a career out of, make sure of that first, because it's really easy to get drawn to something because it's, you know, seems competitive or seems prestigious to get involved in, or, you know, you think you like it because of what you see in the media or on TV. Um, and, and I think it's very, uh, easy to become attracted to plastic surgery in, in that way, but you need to really make sure that it's something that you're excited about, that you're, you're passionate about it, that, you know, every part of the specialty is something that you can get excited about. Um, and that it's a way that you really want to be able to, to impact patients and find meaning in. Right. And, you know, plastic surgery can be very, you know, it can be very attractive because it's all about, you know, things that you hear about boobs and tubes and all that, but you know what? It's not about that at all. It's really about, you know, taking great care of patients, being passionate about what you want to eventually do. I mean, I went into plastic surgery because I saw a famous plastic surgeon doing a cleft lip, a hair lip, and that, that changed me forever when I was at Baylor and I was going to be a heart surgeon. So, so Michael, you said you wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. So, so what changed you? My, my daughter wants to be an orthopedic surgeon too, but she's a ballerina. And so, but yeah, you know, and Nothing against orthopedic surgeons. No. Any orthopedic <laughs> surgeons out there want, watching Dr. Rourke's podcast, don't, don't come at me. They are great. We work with them all the time. Yeah. Um, our, yeah, our specialties cross over in a lot of ways. But the time that I was spending in orthopedics in the beginning, I just felt as if it was a little bit dogmatic. And I thought there was a lot of the surgery that I was seeing that there was some detail or some focus being left out of some in-between parts. And it just, for me, the mentality and the approach and the sort of the physicality of the surgery didn't fit my, my perception of what I thought surgery would be. So, yeah. well, no, and also it's got to fit what you want to do. I mean, you know, plastic surgeons are very individualistic. None of us would agree on almost anything, you know, mm -hmm. including even though I'm training these guys, but everybody, <laughs> you know, and there's so many different ways of doing a rhinoplasty, a facelift. And that is, I think, the good and that's the great thing about plastic surgery, but it's also the hard thing because if you want to want a methodical, a very method focused one way to do it, this is the only way to do a gallbladder or a hip. And that's probably not what 
you want. That's, yeah. that's why you're not going to, you're probably not going to be great in plastic surgery because we're very innovative. We think uh, every case is different and individualized. So, individualized for what the patient needs. Right. And mm-hmm. I think, so I think that's all good advice for, for you all to think about. But the other thing is, you know, just because when you're done with training after 14 years, guess what? You know, you'll be a competent surgeon. You'll be a competent plastic surgeon. You can sit for your boards, the American Board of Plastic Surgery, the written and oral boards. But are you going to be an expert? No, you're not. So that's why I think it's good to get, if you really want to go and go to the next level, you get specialty training, whether it's in hand, micro, facial. That's the beauty. You know, plastic surgery doesn't own an organ like the brain or the prostate, like urology. We own innovation. So that's the great thing about it. So, and then you guys both decided to do aesthetic surgery. So tell me why you did that. So I'm going to, Michael, I'm going to ask you first. Yeah. So um, I, my motivation to do cosmetic surgery training is what I want the bulk of my career in the long term to focus on. And if you look at residency training programs across the country, all of them are relatively deficient on right. cosmetic surgery exposure and cosmetic surgery training. And I wanted it to be the bulk of my future practice. So I decided that a year with a group of expert surgeons um, would be, would be incredibly beneficial for me. How about you, Jeff? Um, Yeah, I, you know, I, I became attracted to aesthetic surgery when I started doing some in in residency and uh, just seeing how powerfully it can impact people's uh, self image, their self esteem um, there's sort of psychosocial well-being, um, and I, I really believe in its ability to help people in that way. Um, and then, in particular, in facelift and rhinoplasty, um, to just you know for for the type of impact that they can have on people's lives and how transformative it can be for for an individual to to go through. Right. No. No. And I agree. and I think you know aesthetic surgery is like any subspecialty training. You know, if you really want to become good at it, you gotta. You've got to train with the experts. You got to train with the masters because that's the way to do it. I mean, I trained with, you know, Dr. Dingman Graham, and I trained with Jack Gunter, who was at the University of Michigan. I mean, he was a rhinoplasty expert. So, you know, I think it's really important to have role models and to, to work with people that are not only at the cutting edge, but at the bleeding edge of innovation. So I, I think it's great. And, and, you know, these guys are at world class training programs in the country. And I, I will just say that. You know, the challenge we all have is in plastic surgery today, you know, you're not going to be an expert. The 10,000 hour rule is isn't germane. By the time these guys, we're done with our training, we have way more than 10,000 hours. 20,000 hours. 20,000. Yeah. 20, 20, yeah, look, for, something like or that, yeah. 14 years. <laughs> yeah. 14 years. I mean, my son said to me, Dad, I'm never going to do that. <laughs> and guess what? He's a hell of a lot smarter than I am because 14 years of delayed gratification. That's usually not normal. Yeah. So it's 14 years of focus and dedication and kind of you want to be the best you can be. I mean, what do you, what do you guys think? Yeah. I mean, 14 years, when you look at it as just 14 years, it sounds like a lot and there's no doubt about it. It's been a long road, but it flies by. It flies by. I feel like I'm just getting started in my undergraduate uh, science studies. You know, if you, at the end of the day, you always tell us to be goal oriented. So if you are goal oriented and you have a very defined goal of where you want to spend the rest of your life doing what makes you happy and what you're passionate about, those intervening years of training, they're honestly, they're enjoyable. It sounds like a long time, but they're enjoyable. Yep. And, um, you know, I, I want to do it any other way if I, if I could, you know, I could change. It. I agree. And I can tell you, you know, I had the same thing when I was with my colleagues, they were all mid-level executives and lawyers, but I can tell you when you're out, it goes like this, it skyrockets and, you know, you're living your best life and, you know, life is not a dress rehearsal. This is the real deal. You know, like, like they said in Top Gun, this is the real deal. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, you know, uh, the, the further you go along, you know, even though it's it's a long road, the further you are along it, the less and less it feels like work because yeah. the more and more you're doing the things that you're really passionate about. And each day you're just excited. You know, you're excited for a, for a long day in the operating room because it's what you love doing and you finish the day and you don't say, oh, my gosh, I'm beat. That was a long, you know, a long, right. hard day of work, even though it, it may have been. You feel 
you know, oh, that was that was a great day because I was doing something that I love. I was helping people in the way that I love helping people. And you get better. Yeah. You get better every day. You yeah. get better. And you're right. I've, you know, I've been in this profession 30 years. I've never worked a day in my life in plastic surgery because I love what I do. And I think if you have that passion every day, then you'll be better and better and you'll get better. And I, and I mean that, you know, you, you, you learn one new thing every day, become better every day. You learn from things that you could do better and you learn from others. I mean, I learn a lot of stuff from you all every day. I learn from my colleagues and that's why it's so important to, to teach, to give back and to innovate. And I think that's the greatest thing about plastic surgery. You can innovate in every area and in aesthetic surgery, of course, there's so many new horizons out there. And so obviously it's things that are excite, exciting, that are passionate. And um, so I think in closing, I would like each of you to give one pearl to people that want to do plastic surgery or that people that want to have plastic surgery. You know, I think you need to seek out not only somebody who's an expert, but somebody who's passionate about what they do. OK, because if you're not passionate, you're never going to be great. I don't care who you are. If you're not passionate, it's got to come from here to here to here to be really great. So, Michael, um, I, you hate when people do this, but I'm going to give two answers. If you don't <laughs> OK, so my number my number one is just a, a general it's just a general approach. The two things that you can really control in any situation that you go into are your attitude and your effort. So when you're just getting into this, just remember that very early on, it's going to seem daunting. Um, you're going to have bad days, but just remember your attitude and your effort every single day are the two things that you can control. And then number two, specifically for plastic surgery is you have to network. You have to meet other plastic surgeons, other people in your, in your medical school, in your undergraduate that have gone on the path that you want to pursue, you have to connect with those people. You have to make yourself uncomfortable and you have to reach out to people, get on the phone, talk, email, because those are the people that have done it. They've paved the way and they can direct you and help you, you know, save you a lot of time doing what right. you're pursuing, what you want to pursue. Yep. Role modeling. Yeah. Good. Yeah, ab yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't, I don't think Mike or I would be where we are right now if we didn't have people that we reach out to, so connected many. with, talk right. to all throughout the process. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's essential. And I think, you know, my, my big piece of advice sort of boils down to a similar point. Um, and then it's all about people, you know, everything that we do in medicine is, is interpersonal by definition. So if you're going into plastic surgery, um, you know, find people who are like you, who you want to, you know, role, role model after, um, and that, uh, you know, people who, who you feel, you know, represent what, what you would like to be, what your goals are, um, and that you can connect with, um, and find a common passion with, um, and, and then similarly for patients, you know, if you're finding a plastic surgeon, find someone that you connect with on a personal level, just like, you know, when we're seeing patients in clinic, we want to connect on a personal level right. with our patients because, you know, that's how we come to a common understanding, common goals and, and accomplish what, what you want to accomplish. Phenomenal. Passion, purpose, positivity. That's what it's all about. I can feel it from these guys. So what a great, great session. I hope you've learned a lot as I've done, because as you know, we want you to be a better you. And this has been a part of that. So hope you enjoyed the podcast. We'll see you next time on Rorick Knows. Thumbs up.